Well, hi there. My name is Clint Laidlaw. I double majored in zoology and biological science. I have a master's and a PhD in biology. And I also own and operate an educational reptile outreach called Clint's Reptile Room in Springville, Utah, which is where we are right now. And I can tell you, as I talk to the public about reptiles, I sure do hear some crazy misconceptions about them, especially snakes. Last year, when I was looking for animal Halloween decorations for our reaction video about those, I was told with great confidence that they don't make snake skeletons because snakes don't have any bones. And that one just totally floored me. <laughs> what other crazy snake misconceptions are out there that are just waiting to shock me like that one did? So I asked you guys in our Clint's Reptiles Facebook group, what snake misconceptions you guys hear? Let's find out what you had for me. All right, Mr. Jason, what is the first snake misconception? Do you know that snakes lay by you to measure when they will be able to eat you? That was one of those that just blew me away when I first started hearing it. There, there were like memes or stories, photos that would come up on social media talking about someone who had the, the you know, a pet boa or something like that. And they'd sleep with it in their bed and it would come and it would cuddle up to them and they thought this was really cute. And then they talked to their vet and their vet's like, oh, you've got to stop doing that. That snake, you got to get rid of that snake. That snake is measuring you to try to figure out at what point it will be able to eat you. And there are a lot of people that believe this and it's really dumb. Uh, it, 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 it's not dumb if you don't know anything about snakes. But for starters, there's only one species of snake on the planet that's ever been verified to have actually eaten a person. That, that doesn't mean that there aren't a few snake species that get big enough to eat things the size of humans. Uh, it's very difficult for a snake to eat a human because of the shape we have. We actually have a whole video on this. But uh, in general, there's just a small handful of snakes, and they're usually not the ones that people are talking about that are actually even capable of ever eating a person. But on top of that, snakes don't put this kind of forethought into their meals, right? They're, they're, not, they're not farming humans or, or any other sort of prey item and trying to decide at which point it's time to harvest. Snakes are opportunistic feeders. All of them big enough to actually eat a person are ambush predators, which means they just sit in an area and let something walk by. And then you have a couple of seconds at most to make a decision to eat it, well, to at least grab it and attempt to constrict it or not. At the end, that's, that's the whole time they're gonna spend planning that out. It's a very, very quick decision that they have to make. I mean, sometimes it might be a matter of a bird flying by you. And are you gonna grab it as it goes by or are you not? So snakes make this decision very, very quickly. They certainly don't spend months and years thinking about it and trying to figure out exactly when they will be the right size. Um, you know, there are times where a snake will bite off more than it can swallow. You know, sometimes they can overpower such a meal, but they can't quite get it down. They usually try and they find out during the effort of attempting to eat it that they just can't make it work. But that's it. That's it. Uh, no snake has ever laid by somebody trying to figure out if they need to wait a few more years before they'll be able to eat you. That's never happened. And it requires, frankly, a level of intelligence and planning that snakes don't have, nor is there any reason for them to have it because they've only got two seconds to decide on prey and then it's gone. The next one is that snakes are slimy. Snakes are slimy. That is one that I hear rather a lot. Uh, it's a very, very common misconception. Generally speaking, snakes don't produce anything even remotely like slime. I did some research recently and it seems that there are a few really rare snake lineages you've never heard of that can excrete some sorts of things onto their scales. But generally speaking, snakes don't have any glands like that in their scales at all. They're very, very dry, unless of course you pulled one out of the water, like, like a water snake or an anaconda or something like that. But generally speaking, snakes are totally dry. Now mammals, like us, we do have the ability to, to produce some kind of slime out of the glands in our skin. So if you feel a snake, I mean, they're very smooth and so that can almost make them feel slippery like they're slimy. But if you actually feel slime, you probably either pulled them out of some slime or it's you. The next one 
is snakes chase people or they just want to bite people. Ah, yeah. Uh, I've definitely heard that one a lot. Generally speaking, snakes are not going to chase you. In general, snakes are not nearly as fast as you are. The very few snake species out there, maybe just one snake species, that is actually large enough to eat a person, so the only one that would really, really associate something like a human with food, is a, a very slow ambush predator. And this would be the reticulated python. So they're not going to have any ability to run down a person. They're not even going to try. They, can, they just sit, they wait, and they grab things as they go by. That would be the only snake that's really going to come after you for any other reason other than they feel threatened by you. They feel like you're going to kill them. And, and like if you look in North America, we don't have a single snake in North America that wins a fight with a person. Um, something like a rattlesnake, you know, they could bite you. And if you didn't get any medical treatment, you could end up dying tomorrow as a result of that interaction. But that doesn't help the rattlesnake that you kill today feel much better about the fact that it got killed today. Every snake in North America loses a fight with a person always. And so the snakes that we have here in North America and in most parts of the world, they're not viewing you as a potential food source. So the only reason they would ever bite you is because they are threatened that you're going to try to kill them. In general, though, biting is an absolute last ditch measure. It's the last thing they want to do. You, you don't pick a fight with a giant just because it walks by you. It's not until you're out of other options that you try fighting back because, again, you're going to lose that fight. Some snakes, though, and, and some other animals that are prey species do something called predator approach. And, and predator approach can be a very, very successful way to avoid being eaten. It works particularly well. Well, just in general, it works against predators pretty well because a lot of predators are adapted to a very specific hunting style. In many cases, that hunting style involves having the element of surprise. And the thing is, they're just not capable of finding a different way to approach prey when that is lost. And so in a lot of cases, if you're a prey species, what has historically been the most successful thing is if you notice, for example, a lion, you just walk right at it. And you're like, I know where you are. You're right there. I'm coming at you. And, and a lot of times, you know, the lion will be like, oh, gosh, what, what do I do now? I, you know, like they have no way to deal with this situation. This isn't how I hunt. Uh, and they just kind of take off out of there. Whereas if you continue to act like you don't see the lion, well, then the lion continues its normal approach to hunting you and you might end up eaten. So some snakes may do some level of predator approach. I've definitely had defensive snakes strike, come towards me, strike, come towards me, strike, come towards me. If I turn off and just walk away, you know, that's over. But as long as I'm there posing a threat to them, some snakes will come at you a little bit. Generally speaking, though, snakes want nothing to do with you and they want to avoid that fight at all costs. So all snakes lay eggs, right? Well, I've definitely heard that on many occasions. More than I hear all snakes lay eggs, I hear people who are very, very surprised when I tell them about snakes like boas, rattlesnakes, garter snakes that are live bearers. And actually a very, very large percentage of all snakes are live bearing, something in the neighborhood of like 40% of all snakes are live bearing. We looked it up and it's something like 20 to 30% of snakes that give live birth. So a uh, little lower than I was thinking, but still a pretty high percentage. And especially as you go up in altitude or latitude, you start to get fewer and fewer egg laying snakes as it becomes increasingly difficult to find suitable places to incubate eggs other than retaining them, and then you can keep them warm by keeping your own body warm, moving around to warm places. For example, as you get up into Alaska, the only snakes are garter snakes, which are a live-bearing snake. And, and so a large percentage of snakes do not lay eggs. There are, in fact, and this is something super cool I just learned about recently. So, for example, almost all of the boas give live birth. But there are a few that don't. And, and some of those that don't, they lay eggs, but they have like a super long gestation period before they lay the eggs. And they lay the eggs and they, they don't have like a normal shell on them. And you can kind of see what's going on in there. And there's a very, very well-developed snake 
at the moment they're laid. So they almost do what is called ovoviviparity, which is where they keep the eggs inside until they're ready to hatch, but they end up laying them just a few days or, or weeks before it's time for them to hatch out. So they lay eggs, but they it's sort of like a halfway in between sort of thing. Aren't snakes poisonous? Aren't snakes poisonous? That is a very common one. Usually when somebody asks me, you know, I'll, I'll for example, have a snake like this. This is a ball python, which is not a dangerous snake in any way, but people will often ask me, is that snake poisonous? And, and I usually respond by saying, most people can't name a poisonous snake. And they go, what? And they go, well, I can. And they start naming snakes, you know, rattlesnakes and king cobras and copperheads and who knows what else. They'll also name things that are totally not dangerous, you know, like boas and anacondas and things like that. But they name all these snakes and when I tell them that's not poisonous, they're shocked. They are shocked. And, and the reality is many of the snakes they list, like rattlesnakes and king cobras, are highly venomous. But venomous and poisonous, while they're both types of, of toxicity, they're different. So they, these are both toxins, but venoms specifically need to be injected into the bloodstream. Uh, in the case of snakes, they use fangs in order to do this, or, or at least very large grooved teeth, which you could argue are fangs. And then and the actual venom needs to be introduced via a wound. Uh, for example, my, my friends uh, Chandler and Tyler, not long ago, I think they drank rattlesnake venom and, and king cobra venom because you can. You can drink it. Your stomach will neutralize the proteins that are in there. They'll denature those proteins unless you have a stomach ulcer, in which case it can get into your bloodstream. It's the worst way ever to find out you have a stomach ulcer. But generally speaking, almost all of the snakes that are dangerous are venomous, but not poisonous. Well then, snakes are not poisonous. Snakes are not poisonous. That's one that I hear more often from people who are snake people. Okay, so people who are not snake people ask me all the time, is that snake poisonous? Snake people have learned, ah, no, they're venomous, not poisonous. And a small minority of snake people know that there are some poisonous snakes out there. This is why I, I usually tell people they can't name a poisonous snake because there are some, most people just never heard of them. They are the keelback snakes in the genus Rhabdophis from Asia. These keelback snakes are poisonous because they eat poisonous, generally salamanders. Uh, so poisonous amphibians that are a big part of their diet and they have special glands that sequester those poisons I will mention that the keelbacks are also venomous. They, they, they look like garter snakes, but they have a medically significant venom to them as well. But they sequester the poison from these salamanders in special glands and become themselves poisonous. So that if they are consumed, well, that's toxic as well. So it's not just a bite from a keelback snake, but also eating a keelback snake that can lead you to have some serious problems or even die. This snake here is a plains hognosed snake which a strong argument can be made that it is venomous. It may also be a poisonous snake, though the research to determine for sure if this is the case, to my knowledge, hasn't been conducted just yet. But these guys also eat poisonous amphibians, toads, and when threatened, they're notorious for playing dead. But it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to play dead in the scenarios in which they do, for one thing, it's after a number of other defensive displays that they will do. And so the animal just saw them alive and well moments earlier. They tend to do this for animals like coyotes and skunks and opossums and raccoons, animals that often will eat a dead snake if they find one, but animals that have an excellent sense of smell. And so when these snakes are threatened, they'll roll over and show kind of a brightly colored belly and they will expose both their mouth and the inside of their vent and, and they'll musk, they'll let out, you know, kind of defecate and just let off what is a terrible smell, but what is a smell that also 
probably advertises to all of these animals that have a great sense of smell that this animal is full of toad toxins and it would be better not to eat it. So it is very likely that that is not them playing dead, but them advertising that they too are a poisonous snake. The only good snake is a dead snake. I've certainly heard that one a lot of times. And I personally disagree with that very, very much. I suppose when it comes to what a good snake is, or a good animal of any kind, I mean, that's a little bit subjective. Snakes certainly do a lot of rodent control. Um, you know, if you're a farmer or something like that, having a large number of snakes around can be highly beneficial because it's gonna keep the rodent populations somewhat more in check. They're not generally going to eat anything that uh, you would eat unless you're eating the rodents yourself. Um, and so, so snakes tend to be very, very beneficial, at least for agriculture, which is really important for human survival in general. Um, and, and overwhelmingly, snakes don't do any harm. That said, they can, they're, they're capable of, of doing harm to people. Uh, you know, if you look in, in North America though, for example, you know, almost nobody is killed by snakes and the majority of people bitten by venomous snakes are bitten on the hands and face and usually while under the influence of alcohol. So you can put together what's going on there. The reality is, I mean, most people have never been walking around and been just bitten randomly by any sort of a snake, let alone a truly dangerous snake. If you are bitten by a truly dangerous snake, you will need to go seek medical attention and then you'll be okay and you'll have a cool story to tell. Uh, it is it is best to respect venomous snakes, uh, to avoid interactions with them where possible. Trying to kill one is one of the best ways to get yourself bitten by one. But if you just leave them alone, snakes are much more than happy to leave you alone. Well, in order to eat, snakes unhinge their jaws. That's a really, really common one. Um, probably all, the vast majority of people, I think, are under the impression that snakes unhinge their jaws. And we actually have a video that I referenced earlier about why snakes don't eat people. And it also walks through how snake jaws actually function. And uh, I would argue that it's cooler than that because the reality is if you needed to swallow the Thanksgiving turkey all in one bite, unhinging your jaw wouldn't solve your problem, right? Your problem is at the front of your mouth, that your mouth can't open wide enough. It's not at the back. That will become a problem later, but that's down the road. Your first problem is the front of your mouth doesn't open wide enough. And snakes are able to do this because their jaw, their front two jaw bones don't fuse with one another. So they don't have a chin like we do. They're just connected by very stretchy ligaments. And so if you imagine that this is the bottom jaw of a snake, I'm the top jaw, their jaws, instead of opening like this, they open like that. And they've got more stretchiness over here and here, they've got what's called a kinetic skull. So the whole skull is very flexible. Not just the bottom jaw, actually the top jaw, even the rows of teeth are not connected. So the jaw bones up there are not connected to the main part of the skull. And so both the top and bottom jaw are capable of walking forward one side at a time and stretching open like this on the bottom jaw. And so that allows the jaw to open very wide and then they walk prey in one side at a time and both top and bottom jaw are working in tandem to pull them in sort of like a treadmill. Very, very cool. Much cooler in my opinion than just unhinging your jaw, something they can't do. Your corn snake is going to eat my dog or my cat or my baby. I've heard that uh, a lot of people there, you know, that they, they, they even say, even people who are interested in getting a snake, they're like, well, I would get a snake. I want to get a corn snake, but I'm afraid it'll eat my cat. The reality is there are pet snakes out there big enough to eat a cat. But more importantly, cats are big enough to eat almost any pet snake you would get. A snake has to be really big before it's capable of eating something the size of a cat. I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, a snake up around 10 feet before it's really gonna be taking on things like cats. So if you're thinking about getting a giant snake and you're planning on having it hang out unsupervised with your cat, then yeah, probably don't get a pet snake. I would also not recommend at any point having your pet snake and your cat together unsupervised or even supervised, mostly because the cat is such a big danger to the snake. But a corn snake will never be big enough to be anything but a meal for a cat.
all snakes are venomous or or dangerous. I, I this one surprises people a lot. I think when they find out that the majority of snakes are not at least what you would consider to be venomous in a medically significant way. There's an argument that can be made that a huge group of the lizards, which includes the snakes, they're all venomous. It depends on how, how liberal you're being with the term venom. But when it comes to something that they could inject that's actually going to have like serious consequences for you, a very small fraction of snakes, especially in North America. In North America, we're talking about coral snakes, copperheads, water moccasins, cottonmouths, and rattlesnakes. And that's it, that's it. Uh, you know, other parts of the world are gonna have a lot of other venomous snakes in general. Wherever you are, it, when you come across a snake, if you don't know what it is, leave it alone. But the reality is in most places, the vast majority of the snakes that you're going to see are non-venomous, not dangerous. I've, I've lived here in Utah for more than what, 11 years now. I've seen venomous snakes in a lot of other states. I'm yet to run into one in this state and I have found a lot of snakes. Not one has had a medically significant venom because the only one we have here are rattlesnakes. I'm hoping to find one this summer. Snakes are boring. They have no personality. I've, I've definitely heard that. A lot of people are under the impression that reptiles in general are just sort of like mindless robots that don't have personality. And it is interesting, you know, just if you encounter two snakes, even of the same species, how differently they can behave from one another. You know, I've just, just looking at ball pythons, for example, I mean, I have some that move around a lot, some that hold still almost all the time. I have got some, a very small number that are very, very grumpy. And there seems to be like a genetic component to that. Some lines of ball pythons seem to be very grumpy. The overwhelming majority are very, very laid back, but there are definitely different personalities. And even within an individual snake, the type of interactions that you have with them can dramatically change things. For example, you know, about uh, six to eight months ago, we got a yellow anaconda here at the, the reptile room. And when we got her, she was very afraid of people. And she would strike at people who were out across the room. She'd strike back at your face while you were holding her. You know, and this is gonna be the biggest snake we have. So that was, that's pretty intense when you know that someday that snake will be big enough actually to kill a person. We've put some work into her, mostly just communicating to her that, yeah, we handle you, but we're never gonna hurt you. And she's completely different. You can hand her to children now. She's great, she's great. So that personality, it, you know, the way that they respond to people in particular can change dramatically based on the way that people interact with them. When a snake has vertical pupils, it means they're venomous. That's, that's definitely something I've heard a lot of times. So you know, people say that round pupils mean non-venomous, vertical pupils mean venomous. Now I can tell you, if you come across a snake that you suspect of being venomous, you probably don't wanna like get in its face and take a look at what its pupils look like. Even if this were true, it would be a quite worthless piece of trivia. Uh, it, it, I mean, if anything, it would get you killed. But vertical pupils and circular pupils do tell you something about a snake. What they don't tell you is whether or not it's venomous. This snake, for example, is the most venomous snake I own. This is my false water cobra. His name is Shelby. And though he is not a true cobra, he is venomous and his pupils are round. That's also true of true cobras and uh, coral snakes and a whole heck of a lot of venomous snakes. Now, now, you know, at the same time, the ball python I had out earlier, it's a completely non-venomous snake. It has vertical cat-like pupils. And what those pupils actually tell you more than anything is when is that snake most active? Vertical cat style pupils can open a lot wider. They dilate much wider than do round pupils. And so nocturnal animals, especially you know nocturnal snakes, tend to have these vertical slit cat type eyes. Meanwhile, diurnal snakes tend to have circular pupils. And so that's really what you can learn from taking a look at those pupils. I wouldn't recommend doing that though if you suspect the snake is highly venomous unless you're using like binoculars or a, a telephoto lens on a camera. Definitely don't go, it's just, those, those are vertical, aren't they? That's not how you wanna learn. 
like to take a moment just to say thank you for being here as we clear up some of these misconceptions. And, and one thing though that I want to share with you that isn't a misconception is that it is rad or stinking rad to be one of our Patreon supporters because we have some really, really awesome features for our patrons. These include extra videos and podcasts and getting to see all the videos early, having your names in the credits. There's just so many cool things and you help us make awesome content like this. So if you're interested in seeing those features or just supporting this channel, please consider checking out our Patreon. The rule of thumb of red touches black, you're okay, Jack. Ah, red touches black, you're okay, Jack. Red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow, something like that. Definitely something I learned as a kid. Uh, you know, and it's something that has some utility, but not enough, because that one works except for when it doesn't. The reason you even care, so this is, this is referring to tricolored snakes that are usually some, you know, red, yellow, black, or red, white, and black in, in coloration, and there are both highly venomous tricolored snakes, the coral snakes, and then there are a lot of mimics, king snakes, milk snakes, and, and a number of others. We actually have a whole video on this. But they are mimics that get a survival advantage by looking a lot like coral snakes. And a lot of people will tell you that you can tell the difference by looking at the banding pattern. And in North America, that rhyme works usually. There are some coral snakes that just have an aberrant pattern. There are some that are like albino coral snakes that don't have any black at all. So they've got white where there would have been black. And, you know, and some sometimes the, the pattern gets mixed up. And so, in general, if you see a tricolored snake and you don't know exactly what it is, just leave it alone as though it were a venomous snake. But if uh, you're somewhere like South America, uh, where we just visited ourselves looking for snakes, including coral snakes, you might have noticed that many of the snakes down there are red, yellow, and black, or red, white, and black, but red touches black, and highly, highly venomous coral snakes. And you can easily, easily make a mistake. So the, the real poem is, if you don't know what it is, leave it alone. It's a good rhyme. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> snakes free roam or cohabitate with lots of other snakes. Definitely seen that just, you know, recently. It's something I saw in uh, one of my favorite movies, We Bought a Zoo, where they sent just a crate full of all kinds of snakes, uh, some of them being snake-eating snakes. Uh, and, and a lot of people just, you know, if they find out you've got 10 snakes, they're like, oh, they just figure you've got like an enclosure with 10 snakes hanging out in it. And uh, the reality is that's just not a good idea for a whole lot of reasons. One of them being the potential for not what I would call cannibalism, because cannibalism usually is eating your own species, though some, sometimes that can happen. But, you know, many snakes eat other snakes. Snakes are the perfect shape for a snake to eat. We were talking earlier about how snakes eat. Well, the easiest thing for a snake to eat is another snake. And on top of that, they can carry a lot of diseases, even, even things like their gut fauna, like the E. coli in their gut. That can work really well for you, but not so well for a different species. You do just fine with human E. coli in your gut, but not so well if you get cow E. coli in your gut. Kind of works the same way for them. Cohabitating, keeping a whole bunch of different snakes together. There are very few ways that goes well and lots of ways it can go wrong. What, what about in a temple, like a cursed temple though? I would keep mostly legless lizards. As long as, as long as the majority are legless lizards, that should work for millennia. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Do snakes even poop? That was a new one to me. That one, that one came from uh, our, our Facebook question. And yeah, snakes totally poop. They, 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 they do. Um, snakes have a very long body and a very short tail. And tails, by definition, come after the end of the digestive tract. Uh, so so the, the definition of the vertebrate tail is a muscular post-anal tail. And so this snake, you can see, it transitions from single belly scoots to split scoots at the end of the, the digestive system. So right at the beginning of the tail. And so the tail is very very short on snakes, and uh, out of that vent, they poop. 
they poop and they pee and they do everything else. It's a, it's a multi-purpose hole, everything but the eating and the breathing, pretty much everything that passes out passes through that particular opening. And snakes generally uh, produce a, a more solid waste, uh, not only their, when they defecate, but also when they urinate, they produce what's called uric acid. Uh, this is like a white paste. It's the same thing that birds produce. It's more water efficient than other forms of, uh, of nitrogenous wastes like, like urea or ammonia. And so, uh, pretty fancy. Now, I, I do know that snakes don't have legs. Snakes don't have legs unless they do. Um, this snake is, is part of a, a big clade of snakes called the colubroides, and that, that is about 80% of all your snakes, and they are legless. But the vast majority of all snake lineages have legs. Uh, it, they've got a, what's called a vestigial pelvic girdle. So they've got uh, remnants of the pelvis. They've got two back legs that usually each have one claw on it. They're, they're frequently referred to as spurs. And this is the overwhelming majority of lineages. So most snake lineages have legs. The biggest single lineage, which constitutes the majority of snake species, don't. And so Snakes often don't have legs, but in many cases they do. Now, snakes don't have ears. Snakes don't have ears that you can see. Um, this, is, this is something that people who know quite a bit about snakes know to look for on, on them. It's, it's one of the ways that you can differentiate a snake from most legless lizards is that they have no external ear openings, but they do have ears. They're just covered over. So sort of like if you cover your ears and you can still hear so snakes do hear, they just, uh, well, we can't see how. Now, I, the one thing I do know about snakes is that they work for the devil. Snakes work for the devil. That's an interesting one. You know, a, a lot of people, when, when they, they see a snake, they assume that they're out to, get, they're out to get you. You know, a lot of times if I'm holding a snake like this, people will ask me with great confusion, why isn't it attacking you? Why isn't it trying to bite you? And, and I usually just respond by asking, well, why would it bite me? You know, there are only two real reasons. It either thinks it's getting food or it thinks I'm trying to kill it. Um, the snake knows it can't eat me. It, it already measured me, right? Uh, and so it knows it can't eat me, but it also has learned that I'm not gonna hurt it. And so there's absolutely no reason for it to pick a fight with me. But a lot of people are very much under the impression that they're just evil. And, and some of this probably comes back to the, the, the references to Satan as, as being in the form of a snake in the Garden of Eden. Uh, something I think is really interesting, you know, just if you look at like the Bible, you know, assuming that that's often the source of, of this, this misconception that snakes work for the, the, the devil, is that in addition to Satan taking the form of a snake, uh, when Moses raises up the, the snake, the, the, flaming, fiery serpent, you know, he's doing so in representation of Christ. So, you know, you, you pick which one you want to be. I, it seems to me snakes might be neutral and you can use them as a, a representation of good or evil. The reality is snakes are just snakes. They're just trying to survive and, and eat. And something I have found truly incredible about snakes is even, even a wild snake that's terribly afraid of you you can communicate very, very quickly with that snake that you are not a threat and they will calm down. And you know, and in many cases, I can take a wild snake that two minutes ago thought I was trying to kill it and was fighting for its life. And now it is peacefully sitting on the shoulders of my son. I'm not sure I could be won over that quickly if, if something came and snatched me up out of my house and uh, you know, that I, it could communicate to me what its intentions were and that everything was okay, and I would just be okay with that. Snakes, I find to be very, very delightful animals, and it's incredible when somebody comes here and holds a snake, you know, it just takes one, and they never view snakes in the same way again. And uh, so hopefully this has helped to clear up a few of the common misconceptions about snakes. If you have more misconceptions you'd like for us to take on in the future, please comment those down in the comments. And as always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Oh, by the way, 
Snakes have skeletons. I'm just imagining the fact that my bobblehead is going to be in this video <laughs> <laughs> constantly talking. I don't know how I feel about that.